Welcome to Exploration Dreamland, a quiet read aloud of the writings of explorers of the real world and the worlds of imagination. Drop anchor, relax into your comfortable bunk, and drift off to dreamland with us as we read Storm Over Warlock by Andre Norton. If you would like to stay in touch between episodes, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Exploration Dreamland. If you would like to recommend a text, please email us at Exploration Dreamland, all one word, at gmail.com. The first season of this podcast is dedicated to the memory of my friend, Ed Sears. He was a runner, coach, science enthusiast, and science fiction aficionado who was often gently encouraging of my crazy ideas. Now, take a deep breath in, and as you exhale, relax any tension in your muscles. Close your eyes. Snuggle into your sleeping space and listen to tonight's tale. Storm Over Warlock by Andre Norton, originally published in 1960. Chapter 7 Unwelcome Guide There was a small eruption of earth and stone as the hound came alive, fighting to reach its tormentors. The resulting din was deafening. Shan, avoiding by a hand's breadth a snap of jaws with power to crush his leg into bone powder and mangled flesh, cuffed Togi across her nose and buried his hands in the fur about Taggy's throat as he heaved the male wolverine back from the struggling monster. He shouted orders, and to his surprise, Togi did obey, leaving him free to yank Taggy away. Perhaps neither Wolverine had expected the full fury of the hound. Though he suffered a slash across the back of one hand, delivered by the overexcited Taggy, in the end, Shan was able to get both animals away from the hole, now corked so effectively by the slavering thing. Torvald was actually laughing as he watched his younger companion in action. This ought to slow up the beetles. If they haul their little doggy back, it's apt to take out some of its rage on them, and I'd like to see them dig around it. Considering that the monstrous head was swinging from side to side in a collar of what seemed to be immovable rocks, Shan thought Torvald right. He went down on his knees beside the wolverines, soothing them with hand and voice, trying to get them to obey his orders willingly. Ha! Torvald brought his mud-stained hands together with a clap the sharp sound attracting the attention of both animals. Shan scrambled up, swung out his bleeding hand in the simple motion which meant to hunt, being careful to signal down the valley westward. Taggy gave a last reluctant growl at the hound, to be answered by one of its ear-torturing howls, and then trotted off, Togi tagging behind. Torvald caught Shan's slashed hand, inspecting the bleeding cut. From the aid packet at his belt, he brought out powder and a strip of protecting plastiflesh to cleanse and bind the wound. You'll do, he commented, but we'd better get out of here before full dark. The small paradise of the valley was no safe campsite. It could not be so long as that monstrosity on the hillside behind them roared and howled its rage to the darkening sky. Trailing the wolverines, the men caught up with the animals drinking from a small spring and thankfully shared that water. Then they pushed on, not able to forget that somewhere in the peaks about must lurk the throg flyer ready to attack on sight. 
only darkness could not be held off by the will of men. Here in the open there was no chance to use the torch. As long as they were within the valley boundaries, the phosphorescent bushes marked a path, but by the coming of complete darkness they were once more out in a region of bare rock. The wolverines had killed a brace of skitterers, consuming hide and soft bones as well as the meagre flesh, which was not enough to satisfy their hunger. However, to Shan's relief, they did not wander too far ahead, and as the men stopped at last on a ledge where a fall of rock gave them some limited shelter, both animals crowded in against the humans, adding the heat of their bodies to the slight comfort of that cramped resting place. From time to time, Shan was startled out of a troubled half-sleep by the howl of the hound. Luckily, that sound never seemed any louder. If the throgs had caught up with their hunter, and certainly they must have done so by now, they either could not or would not free it from the trap. Shan dozed again, untroubled by any dreams, to awake hearing the shrieks of clack-clacks. But when he studied the sky, he was able to sight none of the cliff-dwelling Warlockian bats. More likely they are paying attention to our friend back in the valley, Torvald said dryly, rightly reading Shan's glance to the clouds overhead. Ought to keep them busy. Clack-clacks were meat-eaters, only they preferred their chosen prey weak and easy to attack. The imprisoned hound would certainly attract their kind, and those shrill cries now belling through the mountain heights ought to draw every one of their species within miles. There it is, Torvald, pulling himself to his feet by a rock handhold, gazed westward, his gaunt face eager. Shan, expecting no less than a cruising throg ship, searched for cover on their perch. Perhaps if they flattened themselves behind the fall of stones, they might be able to escape attention. Yet Torvald made no move into hiding, and so Shan followed the line of the other's fixed stare. Before and below them lay a maze of heights and valleys, sharp drops and saw-toothed rises but on the far rim of that section of badlands shone the green of a Warlockian sea rippling on to the only dimly seen horizon. They were now within sight of their goal. Had they had one of the exploration sky flitters from the overrun camp, they could have walked its beach sands within the hour. Instead, they fought their way through a devil-designed country for the next two days. Twice they had narrow escapes from the throg ship or ships which continued to sweep across the rugged line of the coast, and only a quick dived cover, wasting precious time cowering like trapped animals, saved them from discovery. But at least the hound did not bay again on the tangled trail they left, and they hoped that the trap and the clack-clacks had put that monster permanently out of service. On the third day they came down to one of those fjords which tongued inland, fringing the coast. There had been no lack of hunting in the narrow valleys through which they had threaded, so both men and wolverines were well fed, though animal fur wore better than the now tattered uniforms of the men. Now where? Shan asked. Would he now learn the purpose driving Torvald on to this coastland? Certainly such broken country afforded good hiding, but no better concealment than the mountains of the interior. The survey officer turned slowly around on the shingle, studying the heights behind them as well as the angle of the inlet where the wavelets lapped almost at their battered boot tips. Opening his treasured map case, he began a patient checking of landmarks against several of the strips he carried. We'll have to get on down to the true coast. Shan leaned against the trunk of a conical branched mountain tree, pulling absently at the shreds of wine-colored bark being shed in seasonal change. 
The chill they had known in the upper valleys was succeeded here by a humid warmth. Spring was becoming a summer such as this northern continent knew. Even the fresh wind, blowing in from the outer sea, had already lost some of the bite they had felt two days before when its salt-laden mistiness had first struck them. Then what do we do there? Shan persisted. Torvald brought over the map, his black-rimmed nail tracing a route down one of the fjords, slanting out to indicate a lace of islands extending in a beaded line across the sea. We head for these. To Shan, that made no sense at all. Those islands, why, they would offer less chance of establishing a safe base than the broken land in which they now stood. Even the survey scouts had given those spots of sea-encircled earth the most cursory examination from the air. Why? he asked bluntly. So far he had followed orders because they had, for the most part, made sense, but he was not giving obedience to Torvald as a matter of rank alone. Because there is something out there, something which may make all the difference now. Warlock isn't an empty world. Shan jerked free a long thong of loose bark, rolling it between his fingers. Had Torvald cracked? He knew that the officer had disagreed with the findings of the team, and had been an unconvinced minority of one who had refused to subscribe to the report that Warlock had no native intelligent life, and therefore was ready and waiting for human settlement, because it was technically an empty world. But to continue to cling to that belief without a single concrete proof was certainly a sign of mental imbalance. And Torvald was regarding him now with frowning impatience. You were supposed to humor delusions, weren't you? Only, could you surrender and humor a wild idea which might mean your death? If Torvald wanted to go island hopping in chance of discovering what never had existed, Shan need not accompany him. And if the officer tried to use force, well, Shan was armed with a stunner, and had, he believed, more control over the wolverines. Perhaps if he merely gave lip agreement to this project. Only he didn't believe, noting the light deep in those gray eyes holding on him, that anybody could talk Torvald out of this particular obsession. You don't believe me, do you? The impatience arose hotly in that demand. Why shouldn't I? Shan tried to temporize. You've had a lot of exploration experience. You should know about such things. I don't pretend to be any authority. Torvald refolded the map and placed it in the case. Then he pulled at the ceiling of his blouse, groping in an inner secret pocket. He uncurled his fingers to display his treasure. On his palm lay a coin-shaped medallion, bone-white, but possessing an odd luster which bone would not normally show, and it was carved. Shan put out a finger, though he had a strange reluctance to touch the object. When he did, he experienced a sensation close to the tingle of a mild electric shock and once he had made that contact, he was also impelled to pick up that disc and examine it more closely. The carved pattern was very intricate and had been done with great delicacy and skill, though the whorls, oddly shaped knobs, ribbon tracings, made no connected design he could determine. After a moment or two of study, Shan became aware that his eyes, following those twists and twirls, were fixed, that it required a distinct effort to look away from the thing. Feeling some of that same alarm as he had known when he first heard the wailing of the throg hound, he let the disc fall back into Torvald's hold, even more disturbed when he discovered that to relinquish his grasp required some exercise of will. What is it? Torvald restored the coin to his hiding place. You tell me. 
I can say this much, there is no listing for anything even remotely akin to this in the archives. Shan's eyes widened. He absently rubbed the fingers which had held the bone coin, if it was a coin, back and forth across the torn front of his blouse. That tingle, did he still feel it? Or was it his imagination at work again? But an object not listed in the exhaustive survey archives would mean some totally new civilization, a new stellar race. It is definitely a created article, the survey officer continued, and it was found on the beach of one of those sea islands. Throg? But Shan already knew the answer to that. Throg work? This? Torvald was openly scornful. Throgs have no conception of such art. You must have seen their metal plates. Those are the beetlehead's idea of beauty. Have those the slightest resemblance to this? Then who made it? Either Warlock has, or once had, a native race advanced enough in a well-established form of civilization to develop such a sophisticated type of art, or there have been other visitors from space here before us and the Throgs, and the latter possibility I don't believe. Why? Because this was carved of bone or an allied substance. We haven't been quite able to identify it in the labs, but it is basically organic material. It was found exposed to the weather, and yet it is in perfect condition. Could have been carved any time within the past five years. It has been handled, yes, but not roughly. And we have come across evidences of no other star-cruising races or species save ourselves and the Throgs. No, I say this was made here on Warlock, not too long ago, and by intelligent beings of a very high grade of civilization. But they would have cities, protested Shan. We've been here for months, explored all over this continent. We would have seen them, or some traces of them. An old race, maybe, Torvald mused, a very old race, perhaps in decline, reduced to a remnant in numbers with good reason to retire into hiding. No, we've discovered no cities, no evidence of a native culture, past or present. But this, he touched the front of his blouse, was found on the shore of an island. We may have been looking in the wrong place for our natives. The sea. Shan glanced with new interest at the green water surging in wavelets along the edge of the fjord. Just so, the sea. But scouts have been here for more than a year, one team or another, and nobody saw anything or found any traces. All four of our base camps were set inland. Our explorations along the coast were mainly carried out by Flitter, except for one party the one which found this. And there may be excellent local reasons why any native never showed himself to us. For that matter, they may not be able to exist on land at all, any more than we could live without artificial aids in the sea. Now, now we must make a real attempt to find them if they do exist anywhere near here. A friendly native race could make all the difference in the world in any struggle with the throgs. Then you did have more than the dreams to back you when you argued with Feniston? Shan cut in. Torvald's eyes were on him again. When did you hear that, Lante? To his great embarrassment, Shan found himself flushing. I heard you the day you left for headquarters, he admitted, and then added in his own defense. Probably half the camp did, too. Torvald's gathering frown flickered away. He gave a snort of laughter. Yes, I guess we did rather get to the bellowing point that morning. The dreams, he came back to the subject. Yes, the dreams were, are, important. We had their warning from the start. Lori was the first in-scout who charted Warlock and he is a good man. 
I guess I can break secret now to tell you that his ship was equipped with a new experimental device which recorded, well, you might call it an emanation, a radiation so faint its source could not be traced, and it registered whenever Lori had one of those dreams. Unfortunately, the machine was very new, very much in the untested stage, and its performance when checked later in the lab was erratic enough so the powers that be questioned all its readings. They produced a half-dozen answers to account for that tape, and Laurie only caught the recording as long as he was on the big bay to the south. Then, when two check flights came in later, carrying perfected machines and getting no recordings, it was all written off as a mistake in the first experiment. A planet such as Warlock is too big a find to throw away when there was no proof of occupancy, and the settlement boys rushed matters right along. Shan recalled his own vivid dream of the skull rock set in the lap of water. This sea and another small point fell into place to furnish the beginning of a pattern. I was asleep on the raft when I dreamed about that skull mountain, he said slowly, wondering if he were making sense. Torvald's head came up with the alert stance of Taggy on a strong game scent. Yes, on the raft you dreamed of a skull rock, and I of a cavern with a green veil. Both of us were on water, water which had an eventual connection with the sea. Could water be a conductor? I wonder. Once again, his hand went into his blouse. He crossed the strip of gravel beach and dipped fingers into the water, letting the drops fall on the carved disc he now held in his other hand. What are you doing? Shan could see no purpose in that. Torvald did not answer. He had pressed wet hand to dry now palm to palm, the coin cupped tightly between them. He turned a quarter circle to face the still distant open sea. That way, he spoke with a new, odd tonelessness. Shan stared into the other's face. All the eager alertness of only a moment earlier had been wiped away. Torvald was no longer the man he had known, but in some frightening way a husk holding a quite different personality. The younger Terran answered his fear with an attack from the old days of rough infighting in the dumps of Tyre. He brought his right hand down hard in a sharp chop across the officer's wrists. The bone coin spun to the sand and Torvald stumbled, staggering forward a step or two. Before he could recover balance, Shan had stamped on the medallion. Torvald whirled, his stunner drawn with a speed for which Shan gave him high marks, but the younger man's own weapon was already out and ready, and he talked, fast. That thing's dangerous. What did you do? What did it do to you? His demand got through to a Torvald who was himself again. What was I doing? came a counter-demand. You were acting like a mind-controlled. Torvald stared at him incredulously, then with a growing spark of interest. The minute you dripped water on that thing, you changed, Shan continued. Torvald reholstered his stunner. Yes, he mused. Why did I want to drip water on it? Something prompted me. He ran his still damp hand up the angle of his jaw, across his forehead as if to relieve some pain there. What else did I do? Faced to the sea and said, That way, Shan replied promptly. And why did you move in to stop me? Shan shrugged. When I first touched that thing, I felt a shock. And I've seen mine controlled. He could have bitten his tongue for betraying that. The world of the mind controlled was very far from the life Torvald and his kind knew. Very interesting, commented the other. 
for one of so few years you seem to have seen a lot, Lante, and apparently remembered most of it. But I would agree that you are right about this little plaything. It carries a danger with it, being far less innocent than it looks. He tore off one of the fluttering scraps of rag which now made up his sleeve. If you'll just remove your foot, we'll put it out of business for now. He proceeded to wrap the disc well in his bit of cloth, taking care not to touch it again with his bare fingers while he stowed it away. I don't know what we have in this. A key to unlock a door, a trap to catch the unwary. I can't guess how or why it works. But we can be reasonably sure it's not just some carefree mermaid's locket, nor the equivalent of a credit to spend in the nearest bar. So it pointed me to the sea, did it? Well, that much I'm willing to allow. Maybe we'll be able to return it to the owner after we learn who, or what, that owner is. Shan gazed down at the green water, opaque, not to be pierced to the depths by human sight. Anything might lurk there. Suddenly the throgs became normal when balanced against an unknown living in the murky depths of an aquatic world. Another attack on the throg-held camp could be well preferred to such exploration as Torvald had in mind. Yet Shan did not voice any protest as the survey officer faced again in the same direction as the disc had pointed him moments before. Chapter 8 Utgard A wind from the west sprang up an hour before sunset, lashing waves inland until their spray was a salt mist in the air, a mist to sodden clothing, plaster hair to the skull, leaving a brine slime across the skin. Yet Torvald hunted no shelter, in spite of the promise in the rough shoreline at their backs. The sand in which their boots slipped and slid was coarse stuff hardly finer than gravel, studded with nests of drift, bone-white or grayed or pale lavender, smoothed and stored by the seasons of low tides and high, seasonal storms and hurricanes. A wild shore, and a forbidding one, to arouse Shan's distrust, perhaps a fitting goal for that disc's guiding. Shan had tasted loneliness in the mountains, experienced the strange world of the river at night lighted by the wan radiance of glowing shrubs and plants, faced the starkness of the heights. Yet there had been through all that journeying a general resemblance to his own past on other worlds. A tree was a tree, whether it bore purple foliage or was red-veined. A rock was a rock. A river, a river. They were equally hard and wet on Warlock or Tyre. But now a veil he could not describe, even in his own thoughts, hung between him and the sand over which he walked, between him and the sea which sent spray to wet his torn clothing, between him and that wild rack of long-ago storms. He could put out his hand and touch sand, Drift, spray, yet they were a setting where something lay hidden behind that setting. Something watched, calculatingly, with intelligence and a set of emotions and values he did not, could not, share. Storm coming. Torvald paused in the buffeting of wind and spray, watching the fury of the tossing sea. The sun was still a pale smear just above the horizon, and it gave light enough to make out that trickle of islands melting out to obscurity. Utgard Utgard? Shan repeated, the strange word holding no meaning for him. Legend of my people. Torvald smeared spray from his face with one hand. Utgard those outermost islands where dwell the giants who are the mortal enemies of the old gods. Those dark lumps, 
most of them bare rock, only a few crowned with stunted vegetation might well harbor anything, Shan decided. Giants or the malignant spirits of any race. Perhaps even the throgs had their tales of evil things in the night, beetle monsters to people wild unknown lands. He caught at Torvald's arm and suggested a practical course of action. We'll need shelter before the storm strikes. To Shan's relief, the other nodded. They trailed back across the beach, their backs now to the sea and Utgard. That harsh-sounding name did so well fit the line of islands and islets, Shan repeated it to himself. Here the beach was narrow, a strip of blue sand gravel walled by wave-worn boulders, and from that barrier of stones piled into a breastwork by chance, interwoven with bone-bare drift, arose the first of the cliffs. Shan studied the terrain with increasing uneasiness. To be caught between a sea, whipped inland by a storm wind, and that cliff would be a risk he did not like to consider, as ignorant of field lore as he was. They must locate some break nearer than the fjord down which they had come. And they must find it soon, before the daylight was gone and the full fury of bad weather struck. In the end, the wolverines discovered an exit, just as they had found the passage through the mountain. Taggy nosed into a darker line down the face of the cliff and disappeared, Togi duplicating that feat. Shan trailed them, finding the opening a tight squeeze. He squirmed into dimness, his outstretched hands meeting a rough stone surface sloping upward. After gaining a point about eight feet above the beach, he was able to look back and down through the seaward slit. Open to the sky, the crevice proved a doorway to a narrow valley, not unlike those which housed the fjords, but provided with a thick growth of vegetation well protected by the high walls. Working as a now well-rehearsed team, the men set up a shelter of saplings and brush, the back to the slit through which wind was still able to tear away. Walled in by stone, and knowing that no throg flyer would attempt to fly in the face of the coming storm, they dared make a fire. The warmth was a comfort to their bodies, just as the light of the flames, men's age-old hearth companion, was a comfort to the fugitives' spirits. Those dancing spears of red, for Shan, at least, burned away that veil of otherworldliness which had enwrapped the beach, providing in the night an illusion of the home he had never really known. But the wind and the weather did not keep truce very long. A wailing blast around the upper peaks produced a caterwauling to equal the voices of half a dozen throg hounds, and in their poor shelter the Terrans not only heard the thunderous boom of surf, but felt the vibration of that beat pounding through the very ground on which they lay. The sea must have long since covered the beach over which they had come, and was now trying its strength against the rock of the cliff barrier. They could not talk to each other over that din, although shoulder touched shoulder. The last flush of amber vanished from the sky with the speed of a dropped curtain. Tonight no period of twilight divided night from day, but their portion of warlock was plunged abruptly into darkness. The wolverines crowded into their small haven, whining deep in their throats. Shan ran his hands along their furred bodies, trying to give them a reassurance he himself did not feel. Never before when on stable land had he been so aware of the unleashed terrors nature could exert, the forces against which all mankind's controls were as nothing. Time could no longer be measured by any set of minutes or hours. There was only darkness, the howling winds, and the salty rain which must be in part the breath of the sea driven in upon them. 
The comforting fire vanished. Chill and dankness crept up to cramp their bodies, so that now and again they were forced to their feet to swing arms, stamp, drive the blood into faster circulation. Later came a time when the wind died, no longer driving the rain bullet hard against and through their flimsy shelter. Then they slept in the thick unconsciousness of exhaustion. A red-purple skull, and from its eye sockets, the flying things kept coming, going. Shan trod on an uneasy foundation which dipped under his weight as had the raft of the river voyage. He was drawing nearer to that great head, could see now how waves curled about the angle of the lower jaw, slapping inward between gaps of missing teeth, which were really broken fangs of rock, as if the skull now and then sucked reviving moisture from the water. The aperture marking the nose was closer to a snout, and the hole was dark, dark as the empty eye sockets, yet that darkness was drawing him past any effort to escape he could summon. And then that on which he rode so perilously was carried forward by the waves, grated against the jawbone, while against his own fighting will his hands arose above his head reaching for a hold to draw his shrinking body up the stark surface to that snout passage. Lante! A hand jerked him back, broke that compulsion, and the dream. Shan opened his eyes with difficulty, his lashes seemed glued to his cheeks. He might have been surveying a submerged world. Thin streamers of fog twined up from the earth as if they grew from seeds planted by the storm. But there was no wind, no sound from the peaks. Only under his stiff body Shan could still feel that vibration which was the sea battering against the cliff wall. Torvald was crouched beside him, his hand still urgent on the younger man's shoulder. The officer's face was drawn so finely that his features, sharp under the tanned skin, were akin to the skull Shan still half saw among the ascending pillars of fog. Storm's over. Shan shivered as he sat up, hugging his arms to his chest, his tattered uniform soggy under that pressure. He felt as if he would never be warm again. When he moved sluggishly to the pit where they had kindled their handful of fire the night before, he realized that the wolverines were missing. Taggy? His voice sounded rusty in his own ears, as if some of the moisture thick in the air about them had affected his vocal cords. Hunting. Torvald's answer was clipped. He was gathering a handful of sticks from the back of their lean-to, where the protection of their own bodies had kept that kindling dry. Shan snapped a length between his hands, dropped it into the pit. When they did coax a blaze into being, they stripped, wringing out their clothing, propping it piece by steaming piece on sticks by the warmth of the flames. The moist air bit at their bodies and they moved briskly, striving to keep warm by exercise. Still the fog curled, undisturbed by any shaft of sun. Did you dream? Torvald asked abruptly. Yes. Shan did not elaborate. Disturbing as his dream had been, the feeling that it was not to be shared was also strong, as strong as some order. And so did I, Torvald said bleakly. You saw your skull mountain? I was climbing it when you awoke me, Shan returned unwillingly. And I was going through my green veil when Taggy took off and wakened me. You are sure your skull exists? Yes. And so am I that the cavern of the veil is somewhere on this world. But why? Torvald stood up the firelight marking plainly the lines between his tanned arms, his brown face and throat, 
and the paleness of his lean body. Why do we dream those particular dreams? Shan tested the dryness of a shirt. He had no reason to try and explain the wherefore of those dreams, only was he certain that he would, sometime, somewhere, find that skull, and that when he did he would climb to the doorway of the snout, pass behind to depths where the flying things might nest, not because he wanted to make such an expedition, but because he must. He drew his hands across his ribs, where pressure still brought an aching reminder of the crushing force of the energy whip the throgs had wielded. There was no extra flesh on his body, yet muscles slid easily under the skin, a darker skin than Torvald's, deepening to a warm brown where it had been weathered. His hair, unclipped now for a month, was beginning to curl about his head in tight, dark rings. Since he had always been the youngest or the smallest or the weakest in the world of the dumps, of the service, of the team, Shan had very little personal vanity. He did possess a different type of pride, born of his own stubborn achievement in winning out over a long roster of discouragements, failures, and adverse odds. Why do we dream? he repeated Torvald's question. No answer, sir. He gave the traditional reply of the service recruit, and a little to his surprise, Torvald laughed with a tinge of real amusement. Where do you come from, Lante? he asked as if he were honestly interested. Tyre? Calden Mines. The survey officer automatically matched planet to product. How did you come into survey? Shan drew on his shirt. Signed on as casual labor, he returned with a spark of defiance. Torvald had joined the service the right way, as a cadet, then a team man, finally an officer, climbing that nice even ladder with every rung ready for him when he was prepared to mount it. What did his kind know about the labor barracks where the dull-minded, the failures, the petty criminals on the run, lived hard under a secret social system of their own. It had taken every bit of physical endurance and energy, every fraction of stubborn will Shan could summon, for him to survive his first three months in those barracks, unbroken and still eager to be survey. He could still wonder at the unbelievable chance which had rescued him from that merely because Training Center had needed another odd hand to clean cages and feed troughs for the experimental animals. And from the center he made a team, because when working in a smaller group his push and attention to duty had been noticed and had paid off. Three years it had taken, but he had made team stature. Not that that meant anything now. Shan pulled his boots on over the legs of rough, dried coveralls and glanced up to find Torvald watching him with a new, questioning directness the younger man could not understand. Shan sealed his blouse and stood up, knowing the bite of hunger dull but persistent. It was a feeling he had had so many times in the past that he now hardly gave it a second thought. Supplies? He brought the subject back to the present and the practical. What did it matter why or how one Shanlante had come to Warlock in the first place? What we have left of the concentrates we had better keep for emergencies. Torvald made no move to open the very shrunken bag he had brought from the scout ship. He walked over to a rocky outcrop and tugged loose a yellowish tuft of plant, neither moss nor fungi, but sharing attributes of both. Shan recognized it without enthusiasm as one of the varieties of native produce which could be safely digested by Terran stomachs. The stuff was almost tasteless and possessed a rather unpleasant odor. Consumed in bulk, it would satisfy hunger for a time. Shan hoped that with the wolverines to aid, they could go back to hunting soon. 
However, Torvald showed no desire to head inland where they might expect to locate game. He disagreed with Shan's suggestion for tracking Taggy and Togi when those two emerged from the underbrush obviously well-fed and contented after their early morning activity. When Shan protested with some heat, the other countered, Didn't you ever hear of fish, Lante? After a storm such as last night's, we ought to discover good pickings along the shore. But Shan was also sure that it was not only the thought of food which drew Torvald back to the sea. They crawled back through the bolt hole. The beach of gravel sand had vanished save for a narrow ribbon of land just at the foot of the cliffs, where the water curled in white lace about the barrier of boulders. There was no change in the dullness of the sky, no sun broke through the thick lid of clouds, and the green of the sea was ashen to gray which matched that overcast until one could strain one's eyes trying to find the horizon, unable to mark the dividing line here between air and water. Utgard was a broken necklace, the outermost island beads lost, the inner ones more isolated by the rise in water, more forbidding. Shan let out a startled hiss of breath. The top of a nearby rock detached itself, drew up into a hunched thing of armor-plated scales and heavy, wide-jawed head. A tail cracked into the air. A double tail split into equal forks for halfway down its length. A leg lifted as a forefoot, webbed, clawed for a new hold. This sea beast was the most formidable native thing he had sighted on Warlock, approaching in its ugliness the Hound of the Throgs. Breathing in labored gusts, the thing slapped its tail down on the stones with a limpness which suggested that the raising of that appendage had overtaxed its limited supply of strength. The head sank forward, resting across one of the forelimbs. Then Shan sighted the fearsome wound in the side just before one of the larger hind legs, a ragged hole through which pumped with every one of those breaths a dark purplish stream licked away by the waves as it trickled slickly down the rock. What is that? Torvald shook his head. Not on our records, he replied absently studying the dying creature with avid attention. Must have been driven in by the storm. This proves there is more in the sea than we knew. Again the forked tail lifted and fell, the head raising from the forelimb, stretching up and back until the white underfolds of the throat were exposed as the snout pointed almost vertically to the sky. The jaws opened, and from between them came a moaning whistle, a complaint which was drowned out by the wash of the waves. Then, as if that was the last effort, the webbed, clawed feet relaxed their grip of the rock, and the scaled body slid sidewise out of their sight into the water. There was a feather of spume to mark the plunge, and nothing else. Shan, watching to see if the reptile would surface again, sighted another object, a rounded shape floating on the sea, bobbing lightly as had their river raft. Look! Torvald's gaze followed his pointing finger, and then, before Shan could protest, the officer leaped outward from their perch on the cliff to the broad rock where the scaled sea-dweller had lain moments earlier. He stood there watching that drifting object with the closest attention as Shan made the same crossing in his wake. The drifting thing was oval, perhaps some six feet long and three wide, the midpoint rising in a curve from the water's edge. As far as Shan could make out in the half-light, the color was reddish-brown, the surface rough, and he thought by the way that it moved, 
that it must be flotsam of the storm, buoyant enough to ride the waves with close to cork resiliency. To Shan's dismay, his companion began to strip. What are you going to do? Get that. Shan surveyed the water about the rock. The forked tail had sunk just there. Was the survey officer mad enough to think he could swim unmenaced through a sea which might be infested with more such creatures? It seemed that he was, for Torvald's white body arched out in a dive. Shan waited, half-crouched and tense, as though he could in some way attack anything rising from the depths to strike at his companion. A brown arm flashed above the surface. Torvald swam strongly toward the floating object. He reached it, his outstretched hand rasping across the surface. And it responded so quickly to that touch that Shan guessed it was even lighter and easier to handle than he had first thought. Torvald headed back, herding the thing before him. And when he climbed out on the rock, Shan was pulling up his trophy. They flipped the find over to discover it hollow. They had, in effect, a ready-made craft not unlike a canoe with blunted bows. But the substance was surely organic. Was it shell? Shan speculated, running his fingertips over the irregular surface. The survey officer dressed. We have our boat, he commented. Now for Utgard. Use this frail thing to dare the trip to the islands? But Shan did not protest. If the officer determined to try such a voyage, he would do it. And neither did the younger man doubt that he would accompany Torvald. Stay tuned for the next segment from Storm Over Warlock by Andre Norton. Please follow, rate, and review us on your favorite podcast app. Keep in touch with us on Twitter and Instagram, and recommend us to anyone you know who could use a quiet break or a little help falling asleep. Exploration Dreamland is produced, edited, and hosted by me, Sarah Van Zaley. A big thank you to Project Gutenberg for helping me find this and many other interesting publications. Thanks also to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for providing the theme music for this show. The title of this piece is Kalimba Relaxation Music, if you would like to visit his website to hear it in its entirety. Sweet dreams. Sweet dreams.